Sarà Saro Sirani eh, che, che ci farà una comunicazione, una lettura magistrale molto interessante sulle encefalite autoimmuni, soprattutto nel periodo Covid. Mm-hmm. Sara, prego. Eh, di cliccare sulla barra interpretazione italiano e proviamo a vedere se funziona. Se ci fossero problemi e non dovesse funzionare, ritornate su interpretazione inglese e poi cercheremo di fornirvi in un secondo momento la traduzione, ma insomma noi ci proviamo. So now I, I introduce Sarah Shirani in English. Uh, probably we, you do not need any kind of presentation as you, are, as you are a big boss in the field, but Sarah Shirani is uh, the head of the Oxford Autoimmune Neurology Group and the co-director of the Autoimmune Neurology Diagnostic Laboratory. He's a consultant neurologist, clinician and scientist in, uh, with a specific expertise in clinical and laboratory Uh, field of autoimmune encephalitis and in general neuroimmunology. He cares for patients, but uh, is, he also runs a research group uh, with, with a specific focus on the diagnosis and treatment of neuroimmunological and autoimmune conditions. He's a real expert in the field, everyone knows him, I'm sure, and he will give a brilliant lecture, I'm sure, on the diagnosis and treatment of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, he, he, will be, he will focus mainly on clinicians, but he will also talk to patients. So as I said, I hope that this um, simultaneous translation will work. Otherwise, we will provide you a, a translation in a second moment to this, uh, I'm sure, brilliant talk of Sarah Shirani. So thanks once again for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, please give us some knowledge in the field. Thank you, Sarah. Very kind of you. I hope you can hear me clearly. Great. Thank you. Much appreciated. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially on World Encephalitis Day. Thank you to Sarah um, and to her colleagues for organizing today. Um, I can see there's lots of clinicians, there's lots of um, patients on the call, so it's a brilliant mix. My, my talk's going to be more focused um, on some of the research we're doing um, and And I thought I'd, I'd try and give you a little bit of a feel for the sorts of things we're doing. So maybe some more um, examples rather than specifics in some cases. I thought I'd first play a video, which one of my um, clinical fellows, his name's Dr. Ui, and he comes from Canada and he's spending a year with us. He made this film to summarize our work and the sort of things we contribute to the field of encephalitis. Many other groups around the world do very similar work. Um, but I thought I'd show you this film because it's a very nicely put together film. So I hope this comes across well. So I hope that gives you a feel for the sorts of sort of work we're doing in, in, in Oxford at the moment. And I hope the film also gives you a picture of where we try and start from. We always try and start from the patients, from the patient's symptoms. So those are things that as doctors we, we elicit, but also from the patient's experience. And I'll show you an example of that in, in the next few slides. Um, As many people on the call will know, we're very interested in the antibodies, the IgGs of, of That, that circulate in patients' um, serum and their spinal fluid. And of course, these are produced by B cells. This is very well known in immunology. And really the B cells are the key in producing the antibodies. So one of the things we're very interested in is how, how those antibodies are produced, um, who produces those antibodies, which B cells. So this is a very important aspect of our, of our ongoing work. Um, 
And then I think the other thing we, we've become increasingly interested in then is how the antibodies then affect neurons in your brain. And of course, that's more neuroscience aspect. So this is an example of why we, we like the term autoimmune neurology, because it really shows this overlap between the two fields. And I'm going to start by telling you something very simple, which is very well accepted in the field now, which is that we're very interested in antibodies that target the outside of neurons. So we often perform all our tests for antibodies in live cells before they get in any way impaired by the conditions of the test. Le cellule in qualche modo sono impareggiate da um, of a nerve here which is in red and in green you see the labeling of the outside of the nerve so here you see the proteins in triangles la parte esteriore del nervo patients antibodies that go and target those proteins so the corpi sono le particelle rappresentate da la forma triangolare proteins So these antibodies can access their targets if they're in patients. Questi anticorpi possono accedere alle parti specifiche del cervello. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I think it's perhaps me because I'm doing the translation simultaneously. Oh, Is that okay, me? Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, that makes that sense. Is, okay. That is why perhaps I'm like, perhaps you're hearing that I'm talking on you, but I'm just really trying to translate in Italian. Thank you. Sorry about yeah, that. Great. So, yeah, as I say, these are, these are inpatient spinal fluid. And so if they're on the outside of the cells... Quindi è solo fuori dalle cellule. And usually these patients have treatment responsive conditions and that's why we're interested in them. So solitamente questi pazienti hanno delle, delle risposte associated with um, antibodies against the inside of cells, intracellular targets so called. But increasingly with time we're more we're more learning about these ones where the antibodies can actually target the outside of cells and the proteins on cells. Con il tempo stiamo imparando um, a identificare delle nuove particelle che effettivamente sembra che attacchino gli anticorpi. This means they're often treatment responsive and there is a low rate of tumors associated with these diseases. C'è un basso livello di tumore associato a questo tipo di malattia. Today I'm going to concentrate on the two <coughs> ones and show you some examples. Um, oggi mi concentrerò su due parti e vi mostrerò alcuni esempi. Pronto? The first disease I'm interested in telling you about is one which we um, discovered back in 2010 or so, and it's a disease of patients who are in their later years, so usually in their 60s and 70s. It comes on subacutely, so it doesn't really come on like a typical encephalitis that people, that most doctors know. It can come on over months usually, and patients have a number of features. They often have memory loss, they lose their orientation and they have seizures. Some have lots of emotional problems with their disturbances. <coughs> There's a <coughs> which is the low, um, the low sodium level, and many patients have a normal spinal <coughs> again, not typical of an itis. <coughs> and when seeing these patients, we started to learn about um, these attacks. And I'll show you these. These are um, attacks which last. Um, they're very brief episodes. They affect the hemiface and the arm. And then after they occur, you'll see after this a more sudden deterioration in memory. So you'll see that the, after this comes memory. And I'll show you some examples of this now. Um, this is a lady who we looked after um, many years ago. And if you watch her right hand and right face, And you'll see this happen again in a second. E vedrete questo apparire di nuovo in un secondo. So this is very typical of a, a seizure problem. And we call these fasciobrachial dystonic seizures because they um, affect the arm and the face often. They often occur in adulthood. Um, they're very... Generalmente accadono in età adulta e affettano... And sometimes I say that even if... 
If you don't see one, when you go to see a patient, it's probably not the right diagnosis. They're very brief. You saw they occur just for two or three seconds. Um, and they're always associated with LGI-1 antibodies. But this lady you saw was very confused as well. So now I'm going to show you a patient who's not confused. He's writing emails. He's behaving completely normally. He's keeping his job. He works through all this. And you can see he has the same attacks there. You'll see another very little one now, just in two or three seconds. Just there. So these are frequent attacks again in him that shows it, but sometimes people can maintain their thinking during it, maintain their awareness. Um, and as I say, this, this disease peaks here at age 60 or 70 and affects men more than females usually. Most patients have abnormal test results. So these are patients divided by whether they had that cognitive impairment or not. So CI here is cognitive impairment. They have the fasciobrachial dystonic seizures plus the cognitive impairment. And nearly all of them have at least one abnormal test result you'll see in the right hand column here. Almost all of them have one. Whereas the patients who just have the seizures and have no demonstrated cognitive impairment often have normal test results. So this is a clinical diagnosis. So this is a diagnosis which doctors need to make without many tests helping them. Why are these attacks important? Why am I telling you about them? Because they don't respond to these typical anti-seizure medications. There's a very late drop here, but that late drop is because there's only four or five patients left in a study of about a hundred patients. And that's because when you add immunotherapy, the ongoing seizures disappear. And you can really treat these patients very effectively with these therapies. These therapies include steroid treatment, intravenous immunoglobulin and plasma exchange. Maybe, maybe some of you will have had those treatments. And in this blue line, there are patients with and without cognitive impairment. So those without cognitive impairment do even better in terms of treatment. And the other important thing about these is that the seizures come usually before the, um, the memory impairment or the cognitive impairment. The seizures come first. And so we wondered if treating the seizures might stop the subsequent memory impairment. And that's exactly what we saw. So treating the seizures here, the proportion of patients developing cognitive impairment continues if you have the ongoing seizures. If your seizures stop, the cognitive impairment doesn't appear to develop. So we think we have a model for this disease now where um, you start off at your normal function. And if you get early treatment, you can get rescued. You can get back to near normal. But if your treatment is late, you're left with different deficits here. And of course, it's very important to better understand these deficits. And when we started talking to patients about what these deficits were, they weren't necessarily what doctors thought. So this is a, this is a scale used to evaluate, um, use, which doctors use to evaluate um, memory and function, the overall disability of a patient. And these are the percentage of patients that are impaired. So in a survey of these patients, we saw that not many had impairments on either of these domains. These were pretty much normal. But many had impairments across um, combined mood alteration. So this was very common. So we need to understand better how to treat the um, psychiatry manifestations or the mood manifestations in this disease. But even more common was very profound fatigue sometimes. And most patients with this illness will say they have fatigue in the longer term. So this is part of this deficit that we see. And this must think, play into our thinking in the future about how we treat patients. The other thing we observed when we started to meet lots of these patients was this box here. Many patients down here developed a rash on their treatment. This is their anti-epileptic medication or their anti-seizure medication like um, Tegretol or Phenytoin. 
And it was already known that many of these many of these reactions, these rashes to these drugs were driven by an immune factor, a molecule we all express called an HLA molecule, but was predominant in the patients with this disease. So we asked, is this, is this present in these patients? And it was only present at the same rate as healthy people. So we began to doubt ourselves a little bit, but Actually, it turned out that patients with LGI-1 antibodies, almost all, I would say this is now more like 96%, have one single HLA molecule expressed, one HLA allele, DR7 it's called more for shorthand. And the other thing we noticed at the same time was that patients with Casper-2 antibodies had a very different allele. So these patient observations not only directly define what the patient's experience, what their symptoms are, but very quickly start to show us molecular observations. This is, a, this is part of the cause of the disease because this is a genetic association. And thirdly, it starts to pull apart the LGI-1 and the Casper-2 patients who were originally thought to be the same disease. They were all thought to have the same antibody. Then it became clear that wasn't the case. And then it became clear that they have different genetic associations. So these groups of patients have very different underlying biologies. So I'll switch briefly to this disease, which is a disease um, some of you will have had and certainly heard of. It's probably the most well um, spoken about um, cause of encephalitis and is certainly the commonest in younger people. This is an illness of younger people and they tend to present with um, a number of different psychiatric features, which I'll talk about because it's the first problem patients often notice. They can have seizures, but usually one or two, maybe not even two sometimes. They have cognitive impairment and then a range of other features of here of which the movement disorder is the commonest. So these are probably the two hallmarks of this condition. And we wanted to know a little bit more about this psychiatric manifestations here, because if they're the first problem, we thought we could try and do something about it much earlier. And we know that early treatment improves these patients outcomes. So we started to look at adults and we looked at nearly 500 and we looked at this psychopathology as we called it, but really it's the symptoms that, that psychiatrists should be eliciting in these patients. And what we saw is almost any symptom you care to identify is present in these patients. So these symptoms cross a number of domains, which are traditionally relatively separated in psychiatric practice. And there were seven key features. So nearly everyone will have um, these seven features. And in fact, um, they also cross these domains. And you'll see they cross again all these domains. And even in individual patients, most patients don't just have catatonia or just have sleep or just have mood disturbance. They usually have a mixture of these symptoms and some patients have all of these symptoms. And this is obviously very unusual, but here's an example of one of our patients where they have a number of different features which come from these domains. And so our um, a consultant psychiatrist who we work with closely said this is a more turbulent and jumbled syndrome than he has seen before. But I really like the quote from a mother of a patient who said it was in, she was like, she was in front of a buffet of psychiatric things and trying a little bit of them all. And that for me is the hallmark of this condition in terms of the initial presentation. Later, these patients go on to develop other features. This is a young girl who has the NMDA receptor antibodies. And you'll see she has a very um, disturbing movement disorder, often so troublesome that it, um, that it makes parents of the patients very upset to come in and see this regularly. I won't show another video just for time. Um, 
but we asked a number of experts around the world what they thought is the best way to describe these videos. And they said that, and most of the doctors on this meeting will be interested to hear this because these are the people who define movement disorder classifications. And yet they said it was a challenge to preconceived and established phenomenologies. So they gave it almost everything was named in this. In fact, dystonia, chorea and stereotypies with limited tremor is probably the, the take home message here, the hallmark of this illness in terms of the movement disorder. So I often think of this disorder as a very complex disorder. It's complex with its overall symptoms. And then when you go into individual symptoms, they are even more complex in their own right. So I've told you a little bit about the patients and their experience. Um, most of our work focuses on the immunology at the moment, because I think it will teach us how to treat patients best in the future. And I've only shown you a little bit of this so far. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more now about the immunology. So this is a, um, this is a group of patients who I've already touched on, the NMDA receptor antibody patients. And 20% of these young patients have these ovarian tumors that you can see um, in this picture here. Big tumors sometimes, um, and I'll show you more about them in a minute. Because the thing we were most interested in in this disease is why the antibodies can persist for many, many years from onset. So we first asked some simple questions. The first question to understand was, does this disease seem to start in the periphery or in the brain? And it looks very much like this disease and all the other diseases all start in the periphery. So this is the antibody level in your serum versus your spinal fluid. And the levels in your serum are roughly 50 fold higher. So this is true for all the diseases um, we study. So we think this starts in the periphery. So I'm going to give you a very brief reminder of how B cells, which of course fundamentally express and then make antibodies, um, mature in the periphery. So we start off with these naive B cells, which come out of the bone marrow, and they make their ways to specialist centers called germinal centers. Here they meet T cells, they meet antigen, and quite quickly they acquire memory for this antigen. They remember this antigen. You'll have all heard of this in the context of COVID recently. This is true in the context of autoimmunity as well. They then can either make the antibodies and secrete them in the blood, and they're often called plasmablasts if that's where they are, or they can migrate back to the bone marrow and make antibodies here. And the important thing is that the two mechanisms thought to maintain antibodies over many, many decades are either ongoing germinal center reactions or relatively one-off plasma cell reactions in the bone marrow. So long-lived plasma cells niching in the bone marrow. Why is this important? Well, fundamentally, the markers expressed on these cells and their basic properties are very different to each other. So if we could dis determine which is, the main, um, which is the main mechanism, we could apply the appropriate medications to the patients. So here are two examples, just to go through that in a bit more detail. If you had a germinal center reaction, you should get the antibodies as IgMs in red here, and then IgGs. So this is what we see with COVID when you immunize people, vaccinate them, they develop IgM and then IgG to COVID. Here, we're talking about NMDA IgMs. Same, they should have spillover of T cells and B cells into their blood. And this disease should be sensitive to drugs like rituximab because of all these germinal center B cells express CD20. The opposite is true if you had a long-lived plasma cell because your reaction, you'll see the diagram down here, the, the initial exposure will have been a long time ago. So when the patient comes to hospital, they will have no IgM, few or no antigen-specific antigen NMDA receptor-specific B cells in their circulation. 
and their disease will be more sensitive to bortezomib, which is a drug used to treat the plasma cells specifically. So this is obviously now mainly for the, um, mainly for the clinicians and scientists on the call. Um, and the clues that you can get then are you can just test for the IgM. So we can see the IgM in many patients. And when you see it, it can last for many, many months, in which case we think of it as ongoing production, not production a long time ago, which has now persisted because the IgM half-life is five days. So this is really useful because it puts us in the ballpark of the germinal center reaction immediately. And then you can take patient's blood and you can use it to try and understand if the blood has the capacity, the B cells in the blood have the capacity to produce NMDA receptor antibodies. So don't worry about the details here, but essentially after 14 days in culture, these B cells can produce NMDA reactive antibodies if they're taken from a patient's blood. Healthy controls don't do this. And what we started to study then was, does this happen over a variety of time points um, across, um, across a patient's serum antibody level? So this is a variety of serum antibody levels. This is a patient with very high levels of NMDA antibodies, very low levels. And under a number of different conditions, we see the following. First of all, if you use no cytokines to stimulate those cells, or you stimulate them with um, cytokines which are known to help plasma blasts survive, you never produce the NMDA receptor antibody. All the, all the cells are blank. If you use conditions which are known to stimulate memory B cells, you often produce the NMDA receptor antibodies here. So we can return to this model to start to answer the questions. The IgM already puts you in the ballpark of this germinal center. Now we can cross off the plasma blasts because, the, because you'll remember that from this figure, the plasma blasts produce nothing. We don't think they're a major producer. And then we saw that the B cells in circulation, so this in vitro production of the antibody, correlated well with the serum levels of the same antibody. This is true for aquaporin-4 and for NMDA antibodies. And this nice correlation must then tell you that, okay, you've put a line through the plasma blast, but this is unlikely to be a major contributor because what we're seeing here are, is evidence of germinal center reactions. And we began to wonder, did we know that there was a germinal center that we could relatively easily find in our patients? And this is an example of one of these ovarian teratomas from a patient. So we looked at it under the microscope and others had seen this already, that there were lymphoid aggregates within it. And we characterize these in detail. So they express T cells, they contain B cells, lots of B cells, a few plasma cells. And in fact, this is exactly how plasma cells look in, um, in, your, in your tonsils um, or in your lymph nodes. And importantly, they express the NR1 antigen. So this is, this is a germinal center which contains the autoantigen. And in fact, there are many criteria published for what is a real germinal center. And many people say it has to contain these cells, these T follicular helper cells, which help the B cells in the diagram I showed you earlier. And in fact, they do contain these cells. We see the markers for these T cells. Also, they're meant to contain these cells which are known to present antigens, sometimes called follicular dendritic cells. And you can see these follicular dendritic cells very nicely here by morphology um, with a stain which is known to um, detect them. So the big question was, are they actually making the antibody? So if you take the teratoma, we know there are B cells in it. So you can either create little chunks of the teratoma, so-called explants, or you can try and remove the B cells from the teratoma here by flow cytometry. And by fax, you could sort them, and they actually do make the NMDA receptor antibodies under the same conditions 
that the B cells from the blood made the antibodies. And we know that in the, in the patients in whom they have a big cyst in their teratoma, if you take a sample of the cyst, the cyst contains the highest amount of antibody that we've ever detected. So this tells us quite a lot because it tells us that this germinal center hypothesis is very likely to be correct. And these drugs which target CD19, for example, are unlikely to have added benefit for this patient group. So we believe that there's good evidence that lymphocytes, um, that there's good evidence of these germinal center reactions from these IgMs we see from the production of the antibodies from circulating lymphocytes and from the teratomas themselves, suggesting two sets of germinal center reactions. And now we're trying to study which cells feed into these to provide the original onset of this autoreactivity. So what is the real cause of these diseases? And really what we're fitting it to is this overall model in these diseases where um, we can walk through the steps, but if you remember what we're saying is this has to be um, a peripheral immunization which somehow finds its way back to the brain. So we believe that there's a stimulus in the central nervous system, infection or inflammation, where the antibody is produced, sorry, the antigen is produced, it's released, it has to make its way to the periphery somewhere, and then you have this germinal center reaction to make the antibody or the B cell, which then migrate their way back and cause the problem with the nerves in the brain. So that's our preferred model of what's happening in these diseases. So I've talked to you about this, I've talked to you about this. In the final few slides, I'm just going to talk to you about the neuroscience. How does the antibody actually affect the neuron? How do we try and study that at least? And I'm going to move back to LGI-1 because LGI-1 is very complex. So it's actually quite a difficult problem to understand. And we don't have an answer at all yet. And several groups are working on this, but we have some clues. So here's LGI-1. It's secreted proteins that comes out of nerves and it binds in the synapse between these two proteins, ADAM23 and ADAM22. So here's my... Um, high magnification of LGI-1. So it has this um, red domain, which is called the EPTP domain, and it has a blue domain, which is called the LRR domain. And the red domain, the EPTP, has to go and bind to this receptor here, as does this red domain here, has to bind to its receptor. So the blue domain is then left exposed in the synapse. And so what we had to do was find a way amongst all the B cells that we, that we, um, that we harbor and the diversity is thought to be anything around the 1 billion level, 1 billion different B cell specificities. We had to find the ones that targeted LGI-1. And one way to do that is to actually take LGI-1 and apply it to those B cells. And then you can, fish out the ones that are bind, bound by the antigen. And what we found was that if you look in patient's blood and patient serum, nearly every patient has antibodies to both the red and the blue domains. So this is one patient across here. One patient has antibodies to both parts of the molecule, which is very interesting in its own right. However, the monoclonal antibodies allow you to study one or the other. So they typically target either or domain. So we now had, these are now really valuable tools which we've taken from the patient's blood to try and study their disease. One thing we learned straight away is that if you look at the um, number of mutations in the antibodies, both sets of antibodies had lots of mutations. So anything around 15 would be considered um, pretty heavily mutated. And this implies that they've been through that process of germinal centers where they acquire memory for their antigen by mutating like this. 
But we found two very different mechanisms were going on. And I won't show you all the data, but we saw that some antibodies bind their target and then take their target, the LGI1 molecule inside the cell. So that's these blue, these LRR domain binding antibodies. Whereas we found that these EPTP domain binding antibodies prevented, they bound to this red domain and prevented it binding to its two receptors here and here. So very different, but of course you'll remember that both exist in an individual patient, but very different ways of working despite them both existing. So obviously the big question is, do they work together or do they work in opposite manners, in opposing effects? And one way you can start to do that is to um, use experimental animals and inject the antibodies into their brains. And what we see is that the LRR antibodies bind very, very densely to parts of the brain, whereas the EPTP antibodies bind very limited to parts of the brain, suggesting that perhaps these antibodies are going to have more of an effect in patients. And if we think about how to treat these diseases, we might think that blocking these would be a more sensible option if we had to go for one or the other. Alternatively, and probably my view, is that this is not a viable option in patients with LGI-1 antibodies because you've got too many opposing effects. And it would be very difficult to try and target one or the other here. So we have to think more laterally. So my final few slides, I hope I've shown you how we, we often start at patients, but of course the disease starts here with the B cells being produced. The B cells which express antibodies that go and target your brain. In this case, I've shown you examples for LGI-1 and NMDA receptors. And so I've walked you through a few examples of each. And just to summarize, what we see really here, what, I'm, what I've tried to illustrate are highly distinctive clinical phenotypes, which are really important to emphasize because this is how we're going to help patient recognition. And this is how we're going to help early treatment in these patients. Also then we're going to study the B cells and the way the antibodies interact with the nerves to try and define better treatments and think hard about whether we can work out what causes these diseases. So I hope that was an interesting overview of the sorts of work that's going on. Um, I'd like to thank many people from my lab and my group um, and some of the collaborators we work with as well. I hope that was of interest. So thanks, Sarosh. Of course, it was of interest, as always, uh, a brilliant lecture, so very inspiring. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, I think that uh, if, if this is fine for you, we could ask for some questions. Maybe we have 10 minutes left. Oh, maybe it's better if you write down the question in the chat, either in Italian or in English, and then if it is in Italian, I can maybe translate it for you. Quindi dicevo che appunto, beh, ovviamente ringraziavo Sarosh per la bellissima lettura che come sempre insomma è sempre davvero di, di grande aiuto e stimolo per tutti. Dicevo se avete domande che volete fare o in italiano o in inglese scrivete pure nella chat, se preferite scrivere in italiano magari la, la traduciamo noi. So I have a question, I will start with that. Uh, how do you explain the presence of the antibodies in serum and or CSF in different kind of antibody mediated encephalitis? Yeah, um, good question. So I think it's the same in all of them. I think all of these diseases have um, much higher total levels in the, in the, in the serum. And so I think that means that the disease must start in the periphery. And then when the B cells migrate into the brain and, and um, our colleagues from Germany have shown clearly that there are B cells in the brain that encode these autoreactivities, there they produce lots of antibodies in an enclosed space, the cerebrospinal fluid, of course. And so the, the, the overall um, ratio 
is elevated in your CSF compared to your serum. Mm -hmm. And I think that pretty much explains everything. But we have to also say that spinal fluid is a much nicer fluid to work with because it has a much lower total IgG concentration. So you get much, you know, all of you that will have, certainly you, Sarah, all of you that will have seen brain sections or slides looking at antibody binding, the CSF is always cleaner. You can just look down the slide and you know whether you're looking at a serum sample or CSF sample. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about the background, which um, depending on how you do the tests, will determine exactly which one you prefer to use as your substrate and different people prefer different ones for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Thanks, very, very clear. So we have a question from Dr. Ferrari. Uh, well, so I, I will just read it for you. In your experience, paraneoplastic LGI1 have different characteristics from, from non-paraneoplastic ones. I have to confess that we've only seen two patients with paraneoplastic LGI1. Um, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical as to whether it even exists because mm. if you had, I think we've seen 130 <clears throat> now. So if you had two out of 130, I think that would be in a group of patients who are aged between 50 and 80, that would be a baseline incidence of cancer. So I'm not sure it really, I think we could de debate it, but I'm not sure it really exists, but I don't think the clinical characteristics are obviously different, at least from, from those two patients that we've seen. Oh, sorry. So I, I will ask a similar question. Do you recommend screening over the follow-up in LJ1 patients? I mean, two more screening. No, we just do one scan at the start. And as I say, the yield is so low um, that I become skeptical as to whether it really exists. There are clearly some cases in the literature where it must exist, you know, classic tumors associated with, um, associated with the illness and they express the antigen. It's very clear that it does, but it's very rare. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we have a new question. Mm. So they ask your experience on uh, unknown, unknown encephalitis. So what's your experience in patient in which everything comes out negative? And so it's of course uh, encephalitis of uh, maybe suspected autoimmune origin, but at the end it's negative for everything. Um, my experience of it is that actually, you know, there's a, there's a pretty poor outcome on the whole with those patients there. I find them difficult to treat and look after. Um, they often present a bit later. I think that might be part of it. Um, and of course, because they don't have antibodies, unless they have a very clear cut spinal fluid examination or an MRI, I think it's often a lot of diagnostic dilemma over whether to class them as seronegative in the same clinical category or whether you know, lots of people wouldn't necessarily know what the cause of that illness was. So I think they're a very, very hard group to manage. We've got some, unfortunately, unfortunately our worst outcomes are often in those patients. Thanks, I briefly translated because it was from a caregiver. So, uh, quindi diceva appunto che le encefaliti seronegative sono sempre le più complicate da trattare perché ovviamente tutti gli esami risultano negativi e quindi è difficile il management uh, you, you know that you understand the Italian a little bit, so you can correct me if I say something wrong. But uh, yeah, the, il punto è che diceva che sono appunto le più difficili da trattare e da seguire nel tempo proprio per, per questo motivo. I definitely don't understand it well enough to correct you. Yeah, I, it was too fast. <laughs> I did Latin at school, that was as far as it went. Yeah. <laughs> So any other question, qualche altra domanda? Okay, so the question, I think it's related to the um, seronegative cases, is uh, how can we treat them if and uh, if uh, you, you, we, they can contact uh, you or some expert like you for discussing the case? Yeah, of course, with the latter. Um, the How to treat them, I think, it is difficult because we've now begun to tailor our treatment based on the antibody. It makes a difference how much, how much you give people, how often, um, which drug sometimes. So I think it's very difficult, but 
I think most patients, if depending on clinical confidence, you would treat with steroids and plasma exchange, certainly. And then you would decide on how much better they're getting to decide on how much extra treatment. And that would be a balance between your confidence in the diagnosis and in how unwell they are and how much they need treatment. So. Sì, diceva che sicuramente potete contattarlo per un consiglio clinico e per quanto riguarda il trattamento, in fase, dipende ovviamente, di solito il trattamento è eh, collegato al tipo di anticorpo presente, quindi quando non c'è un anticorpo le cose sono più complicate, eh, però in fase acuta, in relazione a quanto si è confidenti sulla diagnosi di encefalite sospetta autoimmune, si trattano con steroidi e plasmaferesi e in base poi all'andamento clinico si può decidere per una terapia immunosoppressiva a lungo termine. So we have some other question. Uh, Marco Zoccarato asks if you could explain possible different rules and efficacy of bortezumib and rituximab since you mentioned it in anti-NMDR encephalitis. Hi Marco, thanks for the difficult question. Um, <laughs> We, um, we, I think it's difficult to answer without clinical trials. And as you may know, there's CD19 agents undergoing clinical trials right now. But my view is that um, most of the data that we and others have generated suggests that germinal center reactions must be a major part of many of these illnesses. Um, I think NMDA is perhaps the one where um, some of the data from the Um, Berlin group suggests that maybe these antibodies are not as heavily mutated as other antibodies in autoimmune diseases, across autoimmune diseases. So it might be that in that condition, it's a very good example of where you have very short-lived B cells that, um, plasma cells, sorry, that are made quickly. They don't necessarily have time to mutate heavily. And these are cells which um, are relatively easily eliminated with rituximab. I'm very skeptical personally that bortezomib clearly helps these patients. And I think it comes with a lot of side effects. So I personally am um, quite, I've never given bortezomib to our patients and I'm pretty reluctant to give it because I don't think it fits with the biology of what we understand so far. Thanks, we have a couple of more Italian question. The first one is, uh, which is the timeline between the antibody production and the first clinical manifestation in encephalitis? That's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think the answer is we just don't know because, we, because the diseases are relatively uncommon. We don't have good examples or many good examples where samples were taken before the illness began. We have a few though, very few. So we know about four patients with LGI-1 antibodies who had a different illness before and were sampled before. And in those patients, it's very clear that the antibodies seem to come on quite quickly over four, five, six weeks, something like that. Quick, I would say, like a vaccination. Whereas we know that, for example, in patients with neuromyelitis optica, who sometimes have an overlap with myasthenia, they have samples taken 15, 20 years before and they're positive. So I think it differs depending, our knowledge is it differs depending on the illness, but perhaps it differs depending on the patient. Um, but definitely there are examples of both. So I think it's one of the problems with trying to understand causation when you talk to patients, you never quite know when the date of onset was. Sì, quindi diceva che è difficile dirlo, è spesso molto complicato perché ci, ci sono casi in cui la produzione anticorpale è molto rapida e ci sono invece dei casi in cui sono stati prelevati dei campioni molti anni prima in altre patologie come ad esempio la neuromielite ottica e, e, e già vi era una positività anticorpale. Quindi di fatto eh, è, è difficile dire quanto tempo intercorra tra la produzione anticorpale e l'esordio delle manifestazioni cliniche. Oh, so one other Italian question. In patient treated with rituximab, Which, uh, which is the treatment uh, scheme that you use? And for the reinfusion, what kind of monitor of, uh, of immun the immunological profile uh, do you use? If you have a specific uh, timeline or treatment schedules or not? I mean, it's, it's, not, um, 
it's not evidence based, but we give it like the most recent MS treatments are given. So one gram and then two weeks later, another gram. Mm -hmm. And then usually we don't monitor anything because in most patients, um, <clears throat> in most patients, that's sufficient treatment. But in the few where they remain refractory to that, I think it's worth monitoring and thinking about whether when they reappear, you retreat. Sì, quindi diceva che utilizza lo schema di un grammo e due settimane dopo un altro grammo, non monitora par cose particolari, a meno che ovviamente non, non si tratti di, di una non risposta terapeutica e quindi poi ovviamente si, si decide come proseguire con, con lo schema terapeutico. Oh, another question is linked with, well, yeah, so we change a little bit the field on viral encephalitis. If you have experience with that and if there is the possibility to... Uh, to an improvement of symptoms in patients with viral encephalitis. Maybe also a different, it's a question related to the differential diagnosis between viral and autoimmune encephalitis. Yeah, what, what Sarah is implying is that there's a, there's a literature suggesting that they, they might overlap viral and autoimmune. So when they do, I think there's a good examples that, that you can treat with immune therapies and help the overall illness. I think in terms of viral encephalitis in the, in the, if it's an isolated entity, it's not um, associated with an immune cause, then usually we, we, we treat the individual symptoms. So patients commonly have mood problems, seizures, and we would treat each of those in isolation to try and help the overall situation. Si sì, dice che è molto importante che ovviamente il, è complessa la diagnosi differenziale delle encefalite, vira, delle encefaliti virali e autoimmuni dove spesso i sintomi si sovrappongono e che è importante trattare anche in maniera sintomatica eh, le singole manifestazioni cliniche che si hanno nel corso delle encefalite. Oh, another, I think that we have two or three more if you have time, I don't know if you are in a hurry, but uh, we have some more Italian questions. Sure. Um, in case of encephalitis, uh, uh, which is not recognized promptly, uh, where the antibodies result negative, but uh, with uh, some kind of viral trigger. Uh, do you think that there is a kind of possibility to improve uh, later on? Yeah, most of our patients continue to improve for, for many, many months and years. So I think there's always that possibility that you continue to improve. And I think also treating the other symptoms around encephalitis, which are not the actual, um, the actual uh, original acute illness is very helpful. We know some patients who had viral encephalitis who then went on to have quite prominent um, psychiatric problems after it. And actually a lot of their quality of life was associated with the depression or the anxiety. <clears throat> And a lot of it got much better once those were specifically addressed. So I think that's definitely something to think about in, in patients with viral disease. Mm -hmm. Dice che ovviamente c'è sempre la, la possibilità di miglioramento nel tempo, che a volte si manifestano anche sintomi come ansia e depressione più tardi, che spesso si associano alle encefaliti virali e che naturalmente vanno trattate e che quando trattate eh, rispondono alla terapia e quindi naturalmente migliora la qualità di vita dei pazienti. Oh, then another one, uh, which are the principal cause of uh, herpes-related encephalitis uh, other than immunodepression, HIV-related? So I think that it's uh, on the predisposing factors of uh, herpes-related encephalitis. Okay, there's a few um, genetic um, factors, but most patients we don't find anything. Most patients we don't understand the cause of any of these diseases. I think um, it's a big neglected area. It's a major area to try and appreciate better. Um, and really, uh, it, for example, in, in my talk, the only example of where we do understand is, is the ovarian uh, teratoma. Otherwise, largely, we don't understand the causation. And I think that's something that we're very keen to focus on because it is a neglected area, I think. Mm -hmm. It's also very difficult to study, of course, which... Sì, dice che ci sono ovviamente dei fattori genetici, ma che spesso i fattori predisponenti non sono noti. Il caso, il caso in cui è più nota è quella dell'encefalite del MDR associata al teratoma ovarico, in cui c'è una chiara casualità, 
ma spesso in realtà non si sa quali siano i fattori predisponenti o scatenanti, quindi sicuramente è un campo nel quale bisogna lavorare. Oh, so, in case of uh, an encephalitis which is not promptly recognized, no, sorry, this was the, the last one. Uh, so let's go on, maybe it was the same, I am going up and down, but yeah, the question is if, uh, uh, so let's go to the other one. Uh, according to your experience and expertise, uh, do you think that a case of a 76-year-old man with limbic encephalitis autoimmune limbic encephalitis with a rap rapidly evolving cause uh, and death within 45 days. Sorry. Ah, if, you, if you find that this is possible. So do you, do you find that it's possible a case of a 76-year-old man with autoimmune limbic encephalitis with a very rap rapid course who died in 45 days? Uh, they found out uh, and MDR antibodies in the CSF and no other infectious or viral cause. Sorry, it was confusing maybe my translation. No, 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 that's, I think, I think it's clear. Yeah, um, no, that's, um, unfortunately that does happen. Yeah, so I think it depends on the, I mean, we've got, a, we've got Domingo on the phone, who's not who, on the call, who's not, who's not, I'm sure you're not quite that age yet, but you were, a very unusual age and gender to develop NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis. We know that from um, Dr. Dalmau's work that the CSF is very helpful and specific in diagnosing that condition. So if you've got that finding, it sounds like you've got the correct clinical context, just a slightly unusual age and sex, then yes, definitely. And, and, and in the acute phase, these patients often have problems with um, blood pressure disturbances and heart rhythm disturbances. So unfortunately, certainly they can die and there is a maybe five to 10% mortality still associated with this condition. I think it's much less now in, in many countries and when recognition is much better, but it's, there's still a definite mortality risk, unfortunately. Purtroppo dice che ci sono dei casi rapidamente evolutivi che si, se si trovano gli anticorpi nel liquor, la diagnosi è sicuramente corretta, anche se l'età non è usuale, e che però ci sono purtroppo dei casi che evolvono molto rapidamente, soprattutto nella fase acuta, dove ci possono essere disturbi autonomici del ritmo cardiaco o della pressione sanguigna, che purtroppo possono evolvere rapidamente. So, uh, how much time we need to, to wait because, uh, before the effect of plasma exchange is seen uh, in, in the acute stage? Um. I think if it hasn't worked by six weeks, it's not going to work. That's my guess that the natural time course of plasma exchange in terms of your IgG levels in your blood, at least, are is about six to eight weeks. So um, most of our patients that where it will work, we see it's worked within 10 days, I'd say, 10 to 14 days. Dice che se si vedono, gli, se funziona, di solito si vedono gli effetti in 10, 14 giorni, e che è difficile pensare che se non... Una funziona nelle prime sei settimane, è difficile pensare che poi funzioni dopo. As for an MDR encephalitis treated with rituximab, uh, how can you predict uh, the relapses? How can you distinguish relapses from, uh, um, we, from the common course or of, of an MDR encephalitis? So how can you distinguish relapses from the natural course? I mean, there are some patients who, in their recovery, they develop extra symptoms. So, for example, there are patients who become quite profoundly psychotic as they're recovering. Mm. So maybe that could get confused with a relapse, but um, it's pretty well characterized now that, that the disease regresses in the opposite way to which it appeared. So often the psychosis does ap ap appear to appear when patients are getting better. Um, so I think that's, maybe that's helpful. Overall though, um, patients will make a gradual improvement apart from those acute, sometimes quite sudden days or few days where they become behaviorally very difficult again, but they will then, they will then improve usually. Mm -hmm. Dice che solitamente il recupero avviene in maniera contraria rispetto a quella che è l'esordio della malattia cioè l'andamento clinico in fase acuta, 
e, ehm, e che possono manifestarsi dei sintomi addizionali durante la fase di recupero, ma che poi nel tempo si, si tendono a risolvere. So they ask if it's possible to contact you and how, if they want to just to provide and discuss with you a case. Well, I think that uh, we are always in contact with him. So just to say that, uh, of course, they can, you can directly contact him, but if you have any doubt, uh, we can maybe do uh, the link between uh, Italian patients and you, if this is fine for you. I mean, I, I always discuss difficult cases uh, with more expert people. So if this is fine with you, we could do like that. That sounds great, yeah. Dicevo che se volete, visto che in molti avete chiesto, sorry, I, I retranslate this, visto che molti avete chiesto un contatto con lui per la discussione di casi, se volete, noi siamo sempre disponibili nel fare da tramite quando non capiamo qualche caso che ci viene sottoposto, con chi è più esperto di noi e ha a disposizione un grosso laboratorio per poter fare una diagnostica avanzata. Uh, Luigi Zuliani, this is in English. More than 10 years after the discovery of these disorders, do you think in your experience they are still underdiagnosed or eventually they are indeed uncommon diseases? Yeah, it's a really good question. Nice to see you, Luigi. Um, I, think, I think they are probably both. So I don't think they account for significant numbers of patients that walk into a psychiatry ward or an epilepsy clinic or a memory disorders clinic. I don't think that is the case. But at the same time, I think there are definitely some patients who have a very, very typical um, form frust, so a very typical limited form of the syndrome. Um, we know several patients now, for example, who have um, seizures and it's typically one of the three or four very characteristic LGI-1 type seizures for many, many months, in one, one or two cases, years before the onset of anything more um, clear cut. And, and I think it's all about clinical recognition because when you go back to those stories, they didn't just have your everyday focal um, medial temporal lobe seizure. They had something unusual about it, which fits the pattern that we've learned from the encephalitis syndromes. But I think it comes back to this point, should we be using terms like autoimmune psychosis, autoimmune epilepsy, or do all these patients just have autoimmune encephalitis and we should stick to one term? Um, I think it's difficult. I don't have a clear cut answer because there are definitely patients who don't have itis. There are definitely patients who don't have enkef. They don't have an encephalopathy at least. So I think it's a really useful nomenclature issue to think through but at the moment I do think there are arguments on both sides that that make it difficult to um, be definitive in all cases but I think you'd capture 90% of people maybe even 95% if you use the term encephalitis and you thought through the sorts of symptoms we know about. Thanks uh, we have the last uh, three questions then then I think that uh, we should stop or we can organize another ask the doctor for you. A lot of people want to ask you many things. So I think that uh, we have the last uh, three ones. The first one is, uh, can uh, autoimmune, encephalitis, autoimmune encephalitis cause epileptic seizure, which then led finally to a cardiac arrest? Yes, definitely. So we've definitely seen people who have quite profound bradycardia with both LGI-1, um, GABA B, and NMDA receptor antibodies. And we sometimes now, um, not, not infrequently, we'll have a cardiologist come and see our patients who have um, an ECG trace that doesn't look quite normal. Mm -hmm. Per rispondere a Fabrizio dice di sì, che ci sono pazienti con LGI-1, GABA o NMDR che in effetti eh, hanno un arresto cardiaco collegato alla patologia di base e alle crisi. E spesso loro hanno un cardiologo che interviene appunto in questi casi. According to your experience, Uh, could uh, be a vascular event the cause of uh, a subsequent uh, autoimmune encephalitis? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I think one of the, that's a really interesting question because one of the things that's always puzzled me is why stroke isn't followed by autoimmunity often. So um, I don't have an answer. I, I have an answer, which is no, I've not seen that but maybe other people have, but I, I, I think it's perplexing why stroke doesn't give you autoimmunity, whereas a number of other brain conditions can. 
Sì, per rispondere a Barbara dice che lui non ha mai visto dei, degli eventi vascolari con successiva encefalite autoimmune, ma che è una cosa che in effetti lo colpisce molto perché molte altre in realtà patologie sono poi seguite a un'encefalite autoimmune, mentre la sua nella sua esperienza gli eventi vascolari tipo stroke o ictus non lo sono. The last one, you partially respond to that, but is, uh, um, do you think that in autoimmune encephalitis there is a, an hereditary component? Yeah, definitely. There, I'm sure there will be. Um, I know that there's an, a, genetic, um, uh, a genetic polymorphism described in the patients with NMDA receptor antibodies now. So I'm sure there will be in others. You've seen the data in LGI1 and CASPA2 from our, um, from our um, studies, but other people have described the similar HLA um, associations in other autoimmune encephalitis syndromes. So I'm sure there will be, but having said that, I'm yet to see a clear cut case of a surface neuronal antibody, which is passed on between any members of a family. So mm -hmm. I've seen it with GAD on several occasions now, three or four families we've got with multiplex syndromes, but I don't think I've yet seen it with any of the other syndromes. Ok, dice che c'è sicuramente una componente, una predisposizione genetica legata a speciali a speciali tipi insomma di HLA che è stata descritta nel, nel G1 e nel MDR, ma che a parte alcuni casi familiari di GAD, lui non ha visto casi a trasmissione direttamente familiare di altre forme di encefalite. So, thanks Arosh, I think that uh, we should stop here because we had really a lot of questions for you, but uh, if people are interested, we, I mean, I think that we could think to, to reorganize uh, to something to share your expertise, uh, which is uh, very, very much appreciated. Eh, dicevo, grazie a Sarosh per, la sua, per il suo tempo e, la sua, e la sua aver condiviso la sua esperienza con noi. Dobbiamo necessariamente andare avanti, altrimenti rischiamo di non finire più, però se siete interessati, insomma, si può pensare di riorganizzare un contatto con l'esperto nel prossimo futuro. So, thanks once again, it was really nice to have you here and to have you be involved in our World Encephalitis Day. And uh, yeah, I hope to discuss again with you soon about... Uh, all these topics and to go, go on with our mutual collaboration on this. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you all. And very nice to see so many old friends and faces. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>